this idea of more. You know, we have a very sacred concept in Islam called barakah. It's a word we're all familiar with. It's a word we use very commonly, barakah. And it's often normally translated as blessing. What's really fascinating even about the linguistic meaning of this word barakah and blessing that is used throughout the Qur'an. This word is actually used to describe Allah. فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ تَبَارَكْتَ يَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَانِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ So this word barakah, even the root, the linguistic root of the word يَدُلُّ عَلَى النِّمَا وَالزِّيَادَةِ It actually means something that lasts al baqa something that lasts for a very long time and something that increases so therefore when we talk about barakah we talk about blessings these are blessings that are perpetually increasing exponentially benefiting blessings and then furthermore when we talk about the islamic concept of barakah and blessing the Islamic concept. There's a dua of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's called Qunut Nazila. It's a dua that was related, taught by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to his own beloved grandson Hassan radiallahu anhu. And I always try to point this out. You know, a big focus of these conferences and these settings, and for a lot of people that are here, is family. Family is a big focus. Think about it. We don't pick up on this quite often, but think about how beautiful it is for a grandfather to pick up his grandson, sit him in his lap, hug him and kiss him, and then say, repeat after me, son. Allahumma hdini fi man hadayt. Wa afini fi man afayt. Wa tawallani fi man tawallayt. Wa barik li fi ma a'atayt. These, you know, this little part of this dua, wa barik li fi ma a'atayt. This right here is the summary of the concept of barakah in Islam. Let me translate this for you. Wa barik, and oh Allah put blessing, put huge, unbelievable, never ending blessings. Li, for me, fi ma, in that which, a'atayta. You have already given. That's the past tense. It's the past tense. A'tayta. Meaning what you have already given. I'm not asking for more Allah. What I'm asking for is that what you have given me is more than enough. It suffices. What I already have is more than enough. I'm just now asking Ya Allah to, in, to inject the element of barakah and blessing into that which you have already given me. That is the concept of barakah. Barakah is not more. Barakah is not about more. Barakah is about the ability to do more with less. Barakah has nothing to do with quantity. It has everything to do with quality. The quality of what you have. I don't need more, Ya Allah. I just need blessing on what I have. The ability to do more with less. And this is something very interesting, very profound. You know, more and less, and blessed and not blessed, and quantity versus quality. And if you really get to thinking, if you do some deep soul searching, it'll, it, it'll hit you like a punch. It'll really knock the wind out of you. Because you read a narration about the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You know, the day that he passed away, there were a couple of mats, there was one or two jugs. There was a mule tied outside the house. There was a sword, there was a shield, and a couple of pairs of clothes. That was the sole possession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the greatest human being to ever walk the face of this earth. That's all he had. And he had nine homes, which is another topic for another day. But just to put it, things into perspective, you got to chew on that for a second. Today we got one home, five people within the home, everybody's got a job, everybody's working, and we're still in debt. Something's wrong, something's missing. And this is where I want to get down to the core of the issue. Dr. Altaf talked about it. But I feel like Dr. Al-Taf was still being a little nice. Even though it's not a fundraiser, you ain't got to be nice to them. Alright? He was still being nice. That's because Dr. Al-Taf is Dr. Al-Taf. By the way, Dr. Al-Taf is like my own personal man crush. You should know that. <laughs> Alright? You should know that. 
All right, just, just putting that out there. It's very embarrassing for my wife right now, but I'm putting that out there. So, but anyways, getting back on topic. I'm just going to lay it down. And I'm going to apologize before I lay it down that if I do offend anyone or I do... If I cross any lines, just please forgive me. Meet me in the bazaar, I'll buy you a hot dog. A halal hot dog, alright? Right? So just come to the bazaar, I'll feed you a hot dog, alright? Don't be mad at me. So, I'm just gonna say it like it is. We have a lot of discourse, we have a lot of conversation, we have a lot of discussion in the Muslim community today about Sharia compliant financing, halal this, Sharia compliant that. And I'm not criticizing, you know, the people that are providing these services. They are very good, beneficial services for those people that need them. But I am keeping it real with y'all for a minute. We are obsessed with the conversation about how can I take something that I don't need, I have no reason to have, there is no explanation for me having it, and find a way to somehow make me feel better about having it. We are obsessed with this conversation in the Muslim community. You want to know what Sharia compliance is? You want to know what halal is? You want to know what the Islamic financing, banking, financial, monetary system is? If you can't afford it, don't buy it. That's Islam. That's Sharia compliance. If you never buy anything you don't need, that's, you are living a Sharia compliant lifestyle. That's as simple as it is. And I know it sounds oversimplified, but it's really not. Wallahi, it's not. We got to understand this. Let me, let me explain something to y'all. There, in some places, for some people, there is even some legitimacy to a conversation about needing to buy a home, even though I personally don't agree with it, but to each his own. Maybe I don't live in your shoes, I don't know your circumstances. I'll tell you, by the way, we talk about, oh, but we have to have a home, we have to live somewhere, I have to raise my family. I lived my entire life in an apartment complex. I lived my entire life in an apartment, and I feel like I turned out okay you understand I'm trying to be real with y'all for a minute you can drive a used beat up old car the first I talked about the car I drove last year I talked about it over here the first car I ever drove the doors had different colors <laughs> and you know what I did when I graduated past that car when I could actually afford to buy a nicer car we had a simple rule if we don't got cash in the home we don't buy it if you ain't got cash, you don't buy it. I know that sounds oversimplified to some people. But that's how you live your life. That's how you live a responsible life. So even when I bought another car with cash, mind you, that other old car with the different colored doors, I didn't sell it. You know why? Because I had a little brother. <laughs> it was too good of an opportunity to pass up. And I made him drive it until he drove the wheels off of it. I actually had to pay somebody to take that thing out of my driveway. But that's just how it works. If you can't afford it, you don't buy it. It's a very, very simple, straightforward philosophy. Let me tell you, let me talk to you about the consequences of living beyond our means. Let's talk about it. Credit card debt. So like I said, you know, I'm not gonna you don't harp too much on homes and cars and all that stuff because somebody might get their feelings hurt, right? And somebody might get upset with me. I'm talking about credit card debt. I'm talking about when you're going and buying your 18th pair of shoes and you can't afford that and you're swiping that card. I'm talking about when you're buying a latte, when you're broke, right? Black coffee will wake you up just as much as that latte will. You won't look as cool, but that's fine. You're already Muslim, man. You're already as cool as it's going to be. But I'm being very serious. So credit cards are when they get out of hand, right? The average amount of credit card debt in the U.S. These statistics are from May 2013, right now. These are current statistics. The average, a household that only has one credit card, which is very rare. Imagine a home, in the whole entire home, in the entire family, there's only one credit card. In that home, per credit card, per household, the average amount of credit card debt in America right now is over $15,000. 
I had an accountant. I was talking about this in a lecture, and you know, there was like some super accountant listening there, and he's, his brain like lit up, and he started doing math on the back of a flyer. And he came to me afterwards and he said that if you tried to pay this off by making like minimal monthly payments, he said it would take you 80 years to pay off $15,000 because of the interest that has accrued over time. I said, A'udhu Billah. 80 years to pay it off? 80 years? The only thing I could think of is like, like you know, the, the, the uh, Laylatul Qadr is the reward of a thousand nights. That's like 80 plus something years or whatever. I was like, this guy's paying off credit card debt for 80 years.